Today's webinar is about medication-assisted treatment, addressing substance abuse in primary care. And our presenters today are Dr. Shane Coleman and Dr. Melissa Shane. And I'm going to invite them to introduce themselves a little bit further right now. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Shane Coleman, originally from Alaska, have been with South Central as the service uh, or division medical director for approximately four and a half years. Um, as such, I help oversee many of the behavioral health services as well as the integration of primary uh, behavioral health into primary care and um, our MAT efforts kind of throughout our system. Good morning, I'm Melissa Shane. I am in Nupiak from Anchorage here. And um, I've been working for South Central Foundation for about eight years, and I practice as a family doctor in our primary care clinic. I'm also the medical director in our primary care 3 East clinic. As I said, my name is Gil Prickett. I work here in our development center as a learning and development clinical advisor. I've been with South Central Foundation for almost 14 years. Much of that time was actually spent working in primary care. Uh, as a behavioral health consultant, uh, but I've been in the development center for almost three years. If you encounter any technical challenges this morning or technical issues with either MediaSite or Mentimeter, please text our technology specialist, Luke Benson Carlo. You can reach him via text at 907 268 7078. Again, our technology specialist for today is Luke Benzincarlo, and you can reach him via text at 907-268-7078. We're going to be interacting with you in a couple of different ways today. The first one is what's built into MediaSite. MediaSite is the uh, platform that you're viewing this webinar on. If you look at the bottom of your screen, on the bottom right-hand corner, you'll notice the little icon. This is the Ask a Question icon. If you click on that, it'll open up a little dialog box. If you open that dialog box, you have a place to put your name, subject, and message, and click Ask a Question. The only thing I would remind you is make sure you enter a valid email address as well so that we can respond to your question. As your moderator, all of those questions will come to me I'll do my best to answer what I can, and if it's something that I can't answer, I'll either open it up to our presenters or make sure that we get a response to you. So if you want to practice that right now, please feel free to do so. I may not respond to all of those questions right now, uh, but if, you'll wanna, if you want to do that, just so you know that it's working, please go ahead and do so. Another way that we're going to be interacting with you today is by using something called Mentimeter. Mentimeter is a real-time polling web uh, platform that allows us to ask questions and for you to respond in real time. It helps us get a sense of where you are as an audience and to, to gauge maybe areas of interest or areas of, um, of direction that it might be helpful for us to go. You can access this either on your computer or via your mobile phone. You can just log on to www.menti, that's M-E-N-T-I, dot com. And you should see a little dialog box, like the one that's on the screen right now, uh, for your website. What we'd like for you to do right now is to practice using this. If you go to menti.com and use the code 250632, and this is the code you'll be using throughout the morning, uh, 250632, and just share your name, where you are, and your role in your organization. We have lots of people registered today, so I don't know that we'll be able to uh, respond to each uh, response we get right now, but we want to see where everybody's from, and so you can get a chance to see where your uh, co-participants are located. So again, go to menti.com. 250632 is the code. Share your name, where you are, and your role in your organization. So I'll just share with our, our um, presenters that we have folks from all over the United States and uh, Canada and internationally who are registered for this webinar. 
um, folks that are uh, clinical, folks that are administrative. So we should see that reflected in the responses we, we get right now. Um, okay. Have you guys, uh, as we're just thinking about this, I know that both of you have talked about this topic elsewhere. Uh, do you notice that, that there seems to be interest from more from clinical folks or administrative folks, or is it everybody who's interested in this? I, I mean, I would say everybody. Um, certainly we get interest from kind of all different levels. Depends a little bit on the audience, for instance, or the, the primary group that you're interacting with. But, um, but if I had to choose one, I mean, I, I guess I would say clinical folks are kind of the most interested, um, you know, both in the clinical details and then also in some of the system pieces that, um, that might be nice to help support their work or help guide their work. Okay, great. And we're starting to get some answers uh, here. We've got Marcy from Las Vegas, who's a registered nurse. Tanya, who is here in Anchorage, who works in consulting. Uh, Dr. Sepienza from Seattle, who's an addiction medicine director. Uh, clinic director Christina from Search, which is in Southeast Alaska. Uh, Rachel, who's from uh, Cass Lake, Minnesota. We've got somebody from Hawaii. Sarah is from Hawaii. Sam from Nashville. Uh, Dr. Kumar from New Jersey. Um, this is great. It's wonderful to see people, so many people participating from across the, the country um, and in different roles being a part of this conversation. We're really hoping that you'll find some benefit from this today and find, um, just get a better sense of how we here at South Central Foundation are approaching medication assisted treatment and addressing the concerns and challenges around opiate dependence. South Center Foundation is an Alaska Native healthcare organization. Our vision is a Native community that enjoys physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual wellness. And our mission is working together with the Native community to achieve wellness through health and related services. That includes what we're talking about today, medication-assisted treatment. Our goals as an organization uh, as SCF, as you can see this very cleverly spells out, our shared responsibility, a commitment to quality, and family wellness. And I think that when we're talking about medication-assisted treatment, it touches on all three of those things. One of the things you'll hear today, one of the terms you'll hear that might be unfamiliar to you, is this term customer ownership or customer owners. Uh, here at South Central Foundation, we don't refer to the people to whom we provide services as patients or clients, we refer to them as customer owners. That is, they're customers in that they're receiving a service from us, but they're also owners because as Alaska Native and American Indian people, they own this healthcare system. We operate under their direction. So we talk about our customer owners. Um, I can't remember if, if you mentioned this or not, Dr. Shane, but you are in fact a customer owner as an Alaskan Native person. Um, many of our employees uh, in both clinical and non-clinical roles are also customer owners. So uh, when we talk about customer ownership, it's something that really is near and dear to who we are as an organization. Our operational principles, and I won't read all of these to you at this time, but our operational principles spell out relationships we really place a premium on the importance of relationships here at South Central Foundation, so much so that we incorporated it into our operational principles. And as you can see, the very first thing in, the, um, in our operational principles is relationships between customer owners, families, and providers. They must be fostered and supported. Everything else that is under that uh, supports that relationships. Uh, that is key to who we are as an organization. We do so by encouraging wellness. Wellness is really our in, part of our core concepts. Core concepts actually refers to two things within our organization. It refers to what you see on your screen, wellness, which is working together in a relationship to learn and grow, encouraging, listening, laughing, noticing, engaging, sharing, and striving. It also refers to a training that is something that all employees attend, usually within six months of hire. Um, it's a three-day training that's led by our president and two, uh, one of our vice presidents and other senior leadership that really talks about all of these pieces that, that we've been discussing thus far and weaves them together. 
This is something that if you, as, as a, um, someone who's participating in this webinar but who's not a, an SCF employee, if it's something you're interested in participating in as a participant at Core Concepts, let us know. Let us know through our Learning Institute. We'd love to have you come up and join us. So that is something that we, uh, that we make available as a resource for uh, attendees outside of South Central, South Central Foundation. Our learning objectives today are as follows. We want to introduce you to South Central Foundation's approach to primary care. We want to examine South Central Foundation's approach to meeting the needs of the primary care system and customer owners during this, the opioid epidemic. And we want to discuss the lessons and challenges that we as an organization have faced in meeting customer owner needs, and I would say systemic needs, during this opioid epidemic. Before we go there, though, what I'd like to do is ask you, our participants, how much has the opioid epidemic impacted your community? So again, if you could go to menti.com and using that code, 250632, um, answer the question that's on your screen here. How much has the opioid epidemic impacted your community? And you'll have some different choices. Not at all, a little, somewhat, a lot, or we're overwhelmed. Right now we're sitting at 100% of our respondees uh, at a lot. So I have a feeling that's probably going to be the same because this has impacted all of us across the, the country. Um, while we're waiting for more responses here, I'm going to ask my uh, panelists, have you noticed, because both of you have been working in the field of medicine for, for some time, have you noticed a shift over the course of, say, the last five years or so to this becoming more and more of a challenge, more and more of an issue that's showing up in, in either primary care or in psychiatry? Right. <clears throat> I think just residing in Anchorage, uh, our community, we're seeing that it is a, a huge problem and in primary care, um, uh, definitely facing not only our customer owners affected by this, but their entire families. And uh, at some times, I think it is uh, even feels overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just echo that. Um, you know, and, and it's it's not been isolated just to the clinic either. I think that um, interacting with communities, you know, um, going and giving some um, educational talks, things like that. I mean, people uh, very frequently are asking about their family member, about their somebody who they know who's a you know has a direct relationship with their family member, etc. So, um, I, I've seen it in. Um, affect uh, conversations with the police, with the Department of Corrections. I mean, there's almost really no community avenue, whether it's personal or, or otherwise, that, um, that doesn't feel like it's had some influence on, unfortunately. Sure, sure. Well, if we look at the responses that we've gotten thus far uh, to our question, you can see that overwhelmingly um, folks are indicating that this has impacted them either a lot or they're overwhelmed as a community. Only maybe one person has said somewhat has this been an issue. Um, I think it would be hard pressed to find any community that said it hasn't affected them at all, at all or it's only affected them a little. So again, thank you for your responses. It's really helpful for us to see kind of where you are uh, in your community in addressing this issue. That being said, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Coleman at this time. Thanks, Gil. Um, so this is, uh, so we're going to get into some of our slides now and tell you a little bit about our um, SCF system, our primary care system. Uh, this is a little bit of an orientation to let you know where we're headed. Um, we'll talk about or tackle these topics uh, first and then uh, transition to kind of a different section of the presentation. But this is to help orient you with regard to our system so you have some uh, understanding of kind of the underpinnings of our primary care. So, so the first thing that we'd like to address is, is what it means to us in some ways to be trauma-informed or to provide trauma-informed care. So I'll, I'll take this opportunity to actually tell you a little bit more about core concepts because to me um, that's part of the setting the stage for our, our, our care system. Um, so as Gil mentioned, uh, it's kind of an internal uh, training uh, sponsored basically by our CEO and our vice presidents uh, uh, who participate in, in each one of these. Um, the curriculum for core concepts is really about uh, the very basics of what it means to listen to story. So what does it mean to listen to story? 
what does it mean to, um, to share a story? It requires creating a really safe space. And, and what that means, how do you create a space where people can share things that are very difficult for them, um, that might feel shameful, etc. cetera? Um, and, and then how do you respond? So not only do you create that space, do you allow them to share, but then how do you respond to them in a meaningful way that helps in their healing and, and helps in their kind of journey to recovery? Um, and this extends not, not just to those basics of how you interact with, with our customer owners, but also even into our physical space, for instance. We don't have just exam rooms. We have what we call talking rooms, which is physical space that's more comforting. It's carpeted. It's more inviting. It's culturally um, uh, you know, more in line with, with what we're asking folks to do, which is um, share, you know, share difficult information in, in a safe space, et cetera, and, and make sure that we respond, you know, in a meaningful way. And I'll just say that, that that has a lot of holdovers for addiction. I mean, that's exactly what you're asking people to do is, is come talk to you about something that's very hard for them, that um, has a high likelihood of being connected to trauma and something that uh, undoubtedly they feel shameful about and, and other things. So this is a really, um, I think, core component of our care and, and really important. So next I'll introduce the integrated care teams a little bit. Um, so our primary care system is really the heart of our, of our care system here. We, we're kind of an outpatient um, system. We are attached to an inpatient system as well, so we kind of have a closed full spectrum of services from outpatient to inpatient. So, so this is the, um, our team makeup, and this is what lies at the heart of our primary care uh, system, which is, is where we want our customer owners to really um, get to know their care providers, their care teams, start generating that long-term um, relationship that's going to be kind of the bedrock of their care um, over, you know, many, many uh, healthy years. So you can see customer owner in the middle there. We have a nurse case manager. That's an RN case manager teamed up with a primary care provider, um, a certified medical assistant, some case management support. That kind of creates the core of our primary care team. And then uh, what we have is kind of um, open physical space, which I'll show you in just a second. But um, we have teams seated next to each other. And then inter, inter, uh, kind of among all of those teams, we have other specialties or other disciplines that we um, have uh, ready access for our primary care teams. Things like uh, dietitians, which you can see there, pharmacists are really important and they've been uh, really helpful in our MAT journey. And then you can also see that we have integrated psychiatrists and master's level clinicians, uh, which kind of represent that um, integrated behavioral health, which I'll, I'll describe as well. Here you can see a little bit of our physical space and structure. Uh, you know, uh, to work as an effective team, we believe that communication is really important. And so having an open space with close proximity to one another uh, really facilitates good teamwork, good communication, which we think is is part of uh, really creating kind of high-functioning teams. If you'd like to find out more about the integrated primary care team model here at South Central Foundation, which really forms the core of how we approach customer owner care, we do have some trainings coming up here on site over the course of the next several months. You can see those listed on your screen right now. This one in April, June, August, and November. We also provide additional consulting around that. If that's something you're interested in, please let us know either by contacting the Learning Institute or visiting our website, scfnuca.com. So diving in a little bit to our integrated behavioral health, um, uh, again, with, with primary care being kind of the gateway into our care system and where we want that relationship to start, um, where we want it to stay long term, uh, you know, we, we thought it was really important to go ahead and embed behavioral health right there in the milieu, in the, in the care team. So we have uh, behavioral health consultants, which we've had for many years, uh, I think uh, upwards of 15 or so. Um, more recently, we've co-located and then even integrated psychiatrists into the pod space. And um, those two resources, I think, are really helpful to try to support primary care docs. They also serve as the beginning of um, parsing out how do we match the intensity of behavioral health need with a customer owner with um, which level of care they provide? So that includes uh, receiving care from either a psychiatrist or behavioral health consultant there in primary care, or maybe referring them to some of our specialty programs and more um, kind of traditional behavioral health care, if you will. Uh, looking at behavioral health consultants themselves, again, this was kind of our first core piece of behavioral health integration. 
Um, they, they have a wide variety of functions that they perform. So you can see that they do some screenings in primary care. You know, they, they rely heavily on um, motivational interviewing to basically perform uh, brief so solution-focused therapies for customer owners. Um, much of the behavioral health need we can kind of meet right there in primary care. We do everything from screening for substance to suicide um, to, to all sorts of um, um, also looking at screeners for um, how are our youth doing in general, how are we assessing their um, just normal growth, um, nothing to do with uh, you know, behavioral health or otherwise, but just uh, developmental screenings in general. Uh, so they do a whole host of, of different health-related and behavioral health-related functions. This is another opportunity you have to come and learn here on site at South Central Foundation. We have several trainings over the course of the next year around our behavioral health integration model. Again, we have trainings coming up in April, June, August, and November. And this is an area we also provide additional consultation. If you're interested in finding out more about this, let us know by contacting the Learning Institute or visiting our website, scfnuca.com. So one of the questions we ask, we want to ask you right now, though, is just getting a sense for your organization. At this time, how prepared is your primary care system to address the opioid epidemic? Again, you can go to menti.com and using that code 250632. Answer this question. How prepared is your primary care system to address the opioid epidemic? You might be a part of a primary care system. You might work in a community where there is a primary care system. Um, maybe there's not a primary care system, and so um, that might be part of the response as well, is not at all, because there's not a way to do it. But how prepared is your primary care system to address the opioid epidemic? We're starting to get some responses. Um, I'm curious, I'm going to ask our, our participants, our, our, our presenters, if you think about um, you know, the, what it took to get where we are now, if we look back, say again, five years, which I, which I keep saying that because it feels like to me that was about when this started really showing up on the national radar. Uh, how prepared were we then as an organization, as a system, to address uh, the opioid crisis? Your thoughts? I, I think um, the, one of the positive things about our system is that it's always changing. It's always responding to uh, customer owner feedback and thinking of ways to adapt to the needs of our community. And I think just having that philosophy alone has really been beneficial in allowing us to um, devise ways to help address the opioid epidemic. I think that's true, and, and I would just add that, um, you know, this journey, uh, I think, really started, like I said, upwards of 15 or so years ago, um, and I would argue that, you know, BHCs being integrated in primary care was one of the fundamental pieces that helped prepare us for future changes, just like Melissa highlighted, and that we've then made kind of successive changes, um, and, you know, uh, definitely we've continued over the last four or five years with the guidelines and other pieces, but I think the Opiate Review Committee, for instance, um, you know, has its um, creation uh, quite a few years ago prior to the kind of more current epidemic, and yet all of these pieces have kind of built on each other. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. If we look at our responses from our participants, we see that the um, majority of them, the vast majority, say that their primary care systems are at least somewhat prepared to address this, the opioid epidemic, which I think is great. I mean, some level of preparation uh, is better than no level of preparation. And, and actually, we only see one uh, respondee, it looks like, who says that they're not prepared at all. Uh, hopefully, uh, that person will learn through the rest of this morning um, some things that maybe they can take back to their organization, to take back to their community that will help increase their level of preparation uh, in addressing this issue. But it is somewhat heartening to see that, that for most folks, there at least is some level of preparation that they feel somewhat prepared to address this, this enormous uh, challenge that we're all facing across the country. Great. So now that we've uh, discussed a little bit about how our primary care system is structured, we'll talk a little bit more now about how we use this structure 
in philosophy to address our opioid epidemic in the community. And uh, we do this again um, with the emphasis on relationship between our customer owners and, uh, and those of us who are uh, striving to meet the needs of our customer owners um, using a team-based approach. And, um, and I think of our approach to addressing the opioid epidemic as really being sort of three-pronged. Uh, with prevention uh, being an, a very important first step in, in preventing progression of this epidemic uh, to a greater proportion. Um, and so we, we really have invested a lot of resources towards uh, effective management of pain, but also alternative uh, pain management modalities. And, um, and really a lot of effort has been um, put towards educating both our customer owners and our uh, prescribing providers on safe prescribing practices. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. Um, additionally, I think it's really important that we, we put a lot of effort towards uh, being able to identify what, uh, when a person is experiencing a substance use disorder. And uh, that involves a lot of education, again, of our customer owners and, and really a, a lot of a greater awareness across our entire system as to what is a substance use disorder and, and how do we reach out to someone uh, with a need. And um, so a lot of uh, what we do to address the opioid epidemic isn't just uh, providing resources for recovery and medication assisted treatment in primary care. There's really uh, other aspects too that we'll, we'll talk about some more. Um, just to clarify though, when we refer to medication assisted treatment during this presentation, we'll be talking about um, the use of medication along with counseling and behavioral therapies to treat substance use disorders and to prevent opioid overdose. So uh, I discussed that uh, really we, we put a lot of emphasis on prevention of opioid misuse and uh, this has required um, a, really a shift in the way that we as providers are prescribing opioids for, for pain. And um, we've really had to make this a system-wide effort to allow consistent messaging to our customer owners and that, um, that opioids are really best used for shorter durations and, uh, and with great caution because of the risk that, um, that goes along with using opioids for pain. And so uh, we've developed a lot of educational materials, posters, brochures, and, and really allowed a lot of education of, of not just providers, but staff in our teams, in our primary care teams, to, to really help provide that consistent messaging, consistent education to our customer owners. And um, we've, uh, this also involves a lot of effort towards involving our administration of the organization to help uh, help them to understand the standards and the policies involved with uh, prescribing opioids and, and using medication assisted treatment for um, as we address uh, opioids in our community and really to involve our administration in helping support the culture change in our organization um, so that we can uh, prescribe more responsibly. And uh, this has required really a lot of um, system-wide buy-in to the process and, and the importance of uh, prevention. So when it comes to um, helping to shift this culture change uh, or shift our culture towards um, more responsible prescribing, this uh, we've had to really look at how how we are, how are we addressing acute pain in our system and and what is a, a more responsible way to do this. So. Um, this has involved a number of discussions across our whole campus, uh, across specialties, um, to really eg examine more closely how people are uh, addressing acute pain. So for an example, um, in our dental clinic, really having our providers uh, take a look at, you know, if someone is coming in for a routine dental procedure, do they really need a prescription for 60 Percocet to go home? Uh, really uh, being more thoughtful about prescribing smaller, more appropriate quantities, uh, shorter duration of treatment for acute pain, 
And, um, and then even giving our specialists permission to tell our customer owners, hey, I don't think I'm the best person to manage your pain. I, I really think you should um, have this discussion with your primary care provider. And that alone has been a big relief for a lot of our specialists who kind of felt stuck uh, previously. And, um, and even with post-operative pain management, uh, I know I personally am much more thoughtful about when I am seeing a customer owner who is scheduled for surgery, I'm going to have the discussion with them then about how we're going to manage their pain post-operatively. Um, that way there's clear expectations for uh, the types of pain medications that will be uh, prescribed after their procedure, how long they can expect to receive that, and then um, what are the other modalities we can use to help keep them comfortable and just keep them reassured that their pain will be addressed and it might not necessarily be solely with opioids. And this has really helped um, prevent those cases in which our customer owners would call, say, the surgeon every week after surgery saying, I need another refill of pain meds. I still have pain. I need another refill. Uh, sometimes uh, previously I, I could recall uh, cases in which uh, our customer owners would come back to me two months post-operatively and they're still getting the same post-operative uh, pain medication regimen that they needed the first week after surgery and then that made for a much more difficult discussion that I had to have with the customer owner about uh, uh, expectations and, and um, the risks associated with that. Similarly, um, we've, we've put a lot of effort into how we address chronic pain and um, a key concept in how we address con chronic pain in our system is really um, uh, educating on the idea that chronic pain is multifactorial. It's more than just the physical pain. We recognize that there's often an emotional component, neurological, uh, and even psychosocial components to chronic pain. And it's essential that we really address all of these when, um, if we're going to see success in our chronic pain management. So we do this uh, by using a wellness care plan. So um, a wellness care plan helps to put this um, multifactorial chronic pain idea into practice by um, creating a document in our electronic health record, which um, is accessible and viewable by any provider who might be seeing that customer owner. And uh, we do this with uh, all of our folks who are receiving chronic opioids for pain. And it really is a, a place where we can document um, the mutual goals that have been set by the customer owner and the provider who is making that wellness care plan. It doesn't have to be the primary care provider uh, creating the wellness care plan with the customer owner. It could even be a dietitian or a nurse case manager. Um, but really the idea is that it's a, it's a document that where we can all refer uh, back to 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 identify what the customer owner's health goals are or wellness goals, um, functional goals. Um, but not only that, to really um, have a place to identify what are the barriers to achieving those goals. And, and then devising ways mutually with the customer owner, how can we best address those barriers so that they can uh, more successfully achieve their goals. Um, and an example for this that, that, that I used, I found it really helpful in a particular case in which I had a gal with chronic pain who had previously been prescribed opioids uh, long term. And, uh, and I, as she came to me to establish care, I, I wasn't convinced that opioids were really the best way to address her chronic pain. Um, I wasn't going to have a big debate about it. Uh, I, I expressed understanding and um, and, uh, and I really wanted to help her achieve her goals and she was hoping that with better pain management she'd be able to attend more uh, days at work and um, be able to get her house chores done more regularly. So, so we made a wellness care plan and, um, and a par opioids were part of this, that there would be a set supply, um, a set refill date, but she would also engage in more physical therapy and um, behavioral health therapy. And so um, 
we had defined a three-month period would be our trial period, and at the end of the three months, uh, we revisited how how she was able to do with her um, with uh, achieving the goals. And uh, unfortunately, the, with the pain medicine regimen that she was on, she said, "Well, I just had no energy to do anything. I slept a lot, and I, I so I didn't make it to work. I didn't attend." Um, physical therapy regularly, and so this really was a this allowed us to have a much more uh, real discussion about uh, that the the medication that she had suggested would be helpful really wasn't uh, the ideal um, to address her pain and to make her more functional, and uh, she was actually very agreeable to um, discontinuing this regimen and focusing more on um, physical. Um, activity and conditioning. So uh, really, really beneficial in, in having these conversations with folks and decreasing the needs for opioids. Yeah. Can I interject very mm -hmm. quickly here? We have a question. I think sure. it's a great question. This is from Kirsten um, Powell. She's asking about wellness care plans, asking how much EHR IT expertise and work did it take to make this plan viewable by all care providers? It's a great question. Oh boy, um, I guess I'm not quite aware specifically how, how much effort it took. I know that um, it's a very basic document and it, it doesn't have to, I don't think it would necessarily require real high tech support um, because it, it could essentially be a, a progress note that gets carried forward. And, uh, and, and in our EHR, we do have on our banner bar, um, along with the, the customer owner's information um, that there is a wellness care plan in place. So just knowing that there is a wellness care plan in the chart can allow providers to easily search for that. So there's a flag of sorts mm -hmm. up on the banner to identify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say, I, I would echo those same things. Is I don't think that, um, I don't think it was technologically sophisticated much at all. Um, now our services and our campus do happen to be on the same domain of our EHR of sorts. So everyone is on the same EHR platform in the same, I think it's domain, I don't know. EHRs aren't exactly my thing, but um, uh, at any rate, uh, so yeah, so it's a matter of, you know, maybe seeing the flag, knowing where to go on the chart, but um, anyone from the inpatient to the ED to the outpatient clinics can, can access the note without any special um, permissions or things like that, right. I think. We use, um, as a campus, we use Cerner is our electronic health record uh, platform and so whether somebody shows up yeah the emergency room if they get admitted to the hospital they show up at dental they show up in primary care fast track wherever it is um, the medical providers the medical staff are gonna have access to the same chart so they'll be able to see if that that flag that is part of the the banner of that person's chart and it will indicate that there is a wellness care plan and then it's just a matter of, of clicking on that and, and you can access the wellness care plan. It's, it's fairly straightforward. Did not take a lot of, of um, special training other than our standard electronic health record training, which yeah. is something that we offer to everybody. And we can do some checking. There's, I know there's some folks who would know the Correct. details of that and we can probably, right. Right. if it's different than what we said, we can fix that. Uh, do you want me to go ahead and sure, describe ahead. the chart real quick? So uh, so this is just a little bit of data to follow with the wellness care plans. Uh, these are emergency department visits per thousand member months. And <clears throat> if you look kind of just past the halfway point left to right in the graph, uh, you can see kind of the dark blue bars in the back. They're generally kind of the highest. Then you proceed to the right. That's December ends there. And then you'd have to jump back to the light blue in January to continue on. Uh, as though it were a continuous timeline. But start with the dark blue, go to the right, go all the way to the left for the light blue, follow that across, and then jump back to the left, the um, orange or yellowish bars, and then proceed uh, to the right again. That's the sequential timeline that you can see of um, how we've affected ER rates uh, with wellness care plans as we've implemented them over time. And the, the idea here being just that the, um, once folks are on a wellness care plan, their ED visits tend to drop fairly significantly over time. So additionally, uh, to ensure that uh, when opioids are used for chronic pain, that they are used safely, we have a number of um, ways to ensure that we are doing this uh, in the safest manner possible. And uh, one, first, we, we 
try to provide every customer owner who's on chronic opioids um, uh, access to naloxone. And so they can easily get this from pharmacy without a prescription or they can get it prescribed from their provider. Um, we have integrated pharmacists in the clinic who can have discussions with the customer owner or their families about how to use this appropriately. And um, We've, we have an opioid review committee, which has been in existence for a great number of years. I'd say oh, probably over 15 or so, huh? Mm. Um, and um, so our opioid review committee is uh, comprised of a number of different types of providers who are available to review cases uh, that primary care providers might have difficulty with. Um, in while they're prescribing opioids for a customer owner, so uh, they may that customer owner may have some red flag behaviors, and the primary care provider might be alarmed by this. And the opioid review committee can be a little bit uh, objective in the case, review uh, what the concerns are, and in some cases can designate that customer owner as um, opioid chronic opioid. Um, ineligible, meaning that this customer owner is, n is probably not appropriate to use opioids long term because of uh, these red flags. And uh, this can be really helpful in our system as uh, co our customer owners have the opportunity to switch providers as they, um, as they need to and uh, allow some consistency uh, among providers in our organization so that if there is someone who's opioid ineligible that it really uh, triggers them to think more uh, cautiously about prescribing uh, opioids chronically for that customer owner. Um, and similarly, it, it, it sort of takes the, the burden of the primary care provider away from being, being the bad guy to say, no, I am not prescribing you this anymore. It can just be more of a discussion of, hey, I had these concerns, the committee reviewed it, and uh, as an organization, we feel that chronic opioids are not safe. Um, and so it, it really helps to maintain that relationship between our customer owner and primary care providers. And um, additionally, more recently, we've developed our um, Cell Centra Foundation specific opioid prescribing guidelines. And these are very much in line with our CDC guidelines that were also recently released, but have really given us um, a lot of support for our prescribers on, on what are safe dosages for opioids, um, especially when used chronically. Uh, what, are, what are the best practices for monitoring? And what are the expectations of our um, uh, teams in, in, in monitoring and prescribing chronic opioids for our customer owners? So I think this is uh, just a quick graph of opioids, uh, the quantity dispensed uh, per month. And I think really it illustrates um, our guidelines went into effect uh, ahead of the CDC and some of the other, I think, kind of national guidelines. So in 2014-ish is when we were working and getting those in place, I think, and you can kind of see uh, a, pretty, a pretty good decline of, of average quantity dispensed of opioids uh, over time. So as I mentioned when discussing our wellness care plan, we really strive to provide a multidisciplinary approach to chronic pain. And so this slide lists a number of the resources that we like to use in, in addressing chronic pain. And so we have a very robust, uh, high-functioning physical therapy department um, with physical therapists well-trained in, in managing chronic pain. They work very closely with our exercise specialists who are housed within the same facility. Uh, in our, we have a great exercise area. And, um, and this really helps to promote um, movement and uh, improving those who are deconditioned. And uh, for those who, who prefer some more traditional healing approaches and healing touch, we have a traditional healing department. And uh, we've even integrated within our primary care clinic, uh, integrated um, pain specialist who has a PMNR background um, to help assess those more difficult cases to really pinpoint w the source of the chronic pain and, and give primary care providers uh, more direction as to what might be the best way to re rehabilitate this condition. And um, let's see, our behavioral health consultants are, are 
uh, very, very much used for addressing chronic pain, the uh, emotional and psychosocial aspects that contribute, and often uh, that's built into our wellness care plan that uh, it might list the medications prescribed, the types of therapies used, and how frequently the customer owner might be seeing behavioral health. Um, so everyone's wellness care plan looks uh, might look completely different from one another. It's really focused on what the customer owner needs. Uh, learning circles are available to uh, allow a, in a group setting more education on what is chronic pain and what are some healthy ways to cope with this and, and prevent um, functional decline. Uh, integrated pharmacists within our clinic are really um, really beneficial in being able to have more education for not just the providers but to our customer owners on what are some of the alternative um, treatments to chronic pain um, with and not just focusing on opioids. So, so this is a, um, a kind of before and after data to illustrate the usefulness of that pain consultant that Melissa just described in primary care. So that pain consultant um, largely does consults to the primary care docs uh, and not so much um, accepting and then longitudinally taking care of folks over time. And it's, it's the impact that we're measuring here of her consulting with the primary care team, uh, sometimes doing co-visits with the primary care doc to help um, them understand or, or um, educate or build skills, et cetera. But um, we really work with the pain specialist in particular in a consultative model so that she's there to, to bolster our primary care, but not so much do the work herself in isolation, if that makes any sense. So, um, so if you look at that first column, uh, go straight down to the middle, the blue line there that says pre-consult monthly quantity. So that's the um, pre-consult um, average uh, quantity of opiates prescribed. And then if you look right under it, after the consult, you have a post-consult monthly quantity prescribed, which drops down to 14.19. Uh, and then the very bottom on the in the white says change in quantity. So between, on average, between uh, what the customer was getting with regard to opiates before the consult versus after the consult, you have, uh, you know, a quite a large reduction there, minus 26, um, um, you know, dispensing of, of opioids on average per, per, uh, to those folks or customer owners. So same data, except now uh, on the right-hand side, we're looking at ED rates. But um, if you see the pre-consult ED rate, it's 0.35 per month. Um, if you look at the post, it's 0 0.26 for a change rate of about 0 0.1 um, in those who have received a consult over time, which again, uh, we feel like is positively impacting our system utilization. So you can see, um, I've highlighted some of the ways that we've, um, we've promoted to help safely prescribe opioids. And another important component in addressing our opioid epidemic is increasing our ability to identify substance use disorders. And so I've listed a number of these um, ways on this slide, including our um, Cell Central Foundation opioid prescribing guidelines. Um, and these are helpful. The, the guidelines are actually used a lot by our opioid review committee uh, who can review cases of um, customer owners in our system who might be receiving large quantities of opioids. And, uh, and when, when this, these cases are reviewed, the Opioid Review Committee can give feedback to the teams who care for these customer owners and say, well, this is how much the, your prescribing practice is deviating from the guidelines. Here's some suggestions for how to more safely manage these customer owners. And uh, it's, it's never punitive and it's, it's, um, it's never done in a way to, uh, to criticize how teams are managing, but just provides some helpful support. And for myself, it's been helpful in, in opening discussion with customer owners that I felt it's been difficult to really um, make any changes in a, in a 
and what I feel would be a safer direction um, in that I can say, you know, this case, your case has been reviewed by our opioid review committee and we have these guidelines in our organization and it looks like the way that our, we're doing your medication regimen is deviating from what are, what are some of the safe standards that we have and the committee has recommended this, this and this and I really think that in order to provide you the best care and be the safest, uh, prescribe the safest way possible uh, because safety is my primary concern for you. I think that we should modify your treatment more towards what the standards are. And uh, this has actually been a really, uh, really beneficial in, um, in, in allowing customer owners to realize that it's not just Dr. Shane being mean and trying to take <laughs> away their opioids. It's really a matter of safety and that the whole organization is really um, on the same page with this. Um, and when it comes to uh, wellness care plans uh, as well, that um, having a wellness care plan in place and seeing where customer owners fall and being able to achieve their goals or not, that also can help open up the discussion for, well, geez, maybe, maybe this medication is starting to do you harm. Maybe some of the behaviors you're having, um, which are kind of hindering you meeting your goals, uh, might be related to a substance use disorder. And um, uh, of course, our prescription drug monitoring program available now in our state has been helpful. I uh, had a customer owner, as an example, who I have known very well for a number of years. Uh, so I thought um, I was prescribing her a small quantity of um, controlled substance for an acute issue, and I happened to check our prescription drug monitoring program, expecting nothing surprising would be there, when in fact uh, found out that this person was being prescribed a number of controlled substances all over town and um, and I was able to uh, actually approach my customer owner in a very um, caring concerned manner saying uh, you know I see that you're being prescribed a number of these um, potentially harmful medications and, and this worries me you know what can I do to help support you and uh, a, a much greater story unfolded and um, but she was very ashamed to have told me anything about this uh, before because she didn't want to let me down so just having this resource available allowed me to approach her very gently and offer the support that she really needed. Um, similarly, educational materials um, have been beneficial in that I had a couple cases of uh, customer owners who saw the poster in my exam room which had a story on it about someone who had chronic pain and were using opioids to treat their pain and um, <clears throat> and uh, had kind of told how that medication started doing them harm and, and leading to addictive behaviors. And these customer owners identified with that story. So even before I entered the exam room, they had that put a lot of thought into it. And by the time I did come in to meet with them for their visit, they said, you know what, that, that story, that's me. And I need help with getting off my medications. Um, and so, so really, uh, offering a lot of these um, different ways to help support our, uh, our providers and our customer owners and having these conversations really helps to destigmatize um, substance use disorders and increase the conversations that we're having um, to offer assistance to those who are affected adversely from opioids. And uh, similarly, it's essential, I think, in our system that uh, because we do have a number of different specialties and departments on our campus that we have easy communication um, between our departments. I've had uh, ER providers who were able to easily get a message to me that they were seeing one of my customer owners who I did not know had a substance use disorder, but they were treating them for an uh, issue, an acute issue related to that. Um, so that allowed me the information I needed to have a gentle, uh, caring, concerned conversation with my customer owner without putting the burden on the customer owner to come to me um, and, uh, and necessarily divulge this information that they're ashamed of often. So we have another question which mm -hmm. I think uh, fits very nicely with that about the open communication between departments. The question is around, we're talking about all of this information and kind of the uh, consent to share or informed consent mm. around this topic. Um, so one of the things that, that I think about with that is because we are kind of 
we talk about the hospital and we talk about inpatient and outpatient, but we're kind of an integrated system, completely integrated system. So whether you're showing up in primary care here on campus or you're going to the emergency room, there's only one medical chart that everybody has access to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in some ways that, that uh, people understand, I think everybody who receives services here understands that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm wondering if that's been a, something that you've encountered as a challenge. Well, I can speak a little bit to this specifically, especially from the behavioral health point of view, and we'll touch on this more a little bit later in the presentation, but um, 42 CFR Part 2 is something that um, behavioral health is fairly used to dealing with. Um, primary care, usually not so much, and I found that the, the MAT discussion is oftentimes the first time they're hearing about this. Uh, it definitely has implications in the AHR. It has implications in, in where you're performing services. Um, but basically, that 42 CFR Part 2 is... Um, uh, federal code of regulation that governs um, special protections for substance treatment. And so um, so that's been kind of the biggest piece I think that's come up with regard to um, release of informations on the campus. We had to make sure that we had different versions that were adherent or um, compliant of sorts with that, with those regulations, and then uh, make sure that an effort up front was given, like in our intensive outpatient program, we make sure to use um, a release of information that allows primary care um, access to some of their information, including the, the integrated psychiatrist, for instance, so that we can chat with the um, intensive outpatient program clinicians and chemical dependency counselors. So, so it was an issue that we had to talk about. Um, we had to jump through some hoops and figure out how it made sense in our system. And we still struggle a little bit uh, on the inpatient side. Um, this is, I won't go into too much detail, but we're uh, two sister companies basically run both halves of our outpatient and inpatient services. And so um, that creates uh, some more hoops to jump through with regard to ROIs in the hospital. I can say, though, with my customer owners who um, I've received information about from either specialists or emergency room uh, uh, providers, um, my customer owners are actually relieved that I received that information, that they didn't have to come to me to tell me. And, um, and, and especially because we really emphasize relationship and, and provide it a really safe and um, caring environment, uh, I, I don't think people necessarily feel violated or, or that their um, information was, was mishandled. Or, so. So one of the things that, that we, again, want to make you aware of is obviously we've talked about some of the, some of the way, things that we've learned as we have navigated through this and understanding how to, how to approach opiate use and treatment of opiate use and dependence in our system. Uh, that's something that we can offer some guidance to you as well uh, around how your organization either might implement these some of these things that we've been talking about or or um, tweak something you already have in place to make it work better so this is something we can provide some consultation on if that's something you're interested in please reach out to us you can reach out to us via the contact information that you see on your screen or through scfnuca.com we also want to ask at this time uh, for some some input input from you and we're going to ask, and I know this is hard, in one sentence, um, try not to make it too long of a sentence, uh, describe your organization's approach to addressing the opioid epidemic. And you can do that again by going to menti.com and using the code 250632. Um, and we ask you to do that now so we can kind of just get a sense of what are people doing right now. Um, so we have one response already, medication management and multidisciplinary committee that addresses opioid prescriptions and integrated tribal work, example, Narcan protocols. Okay. Setting up more comprehensive programs now, drug court, residential treatment program, employee Narcan training. Interesting to see Narcan mentioned in our first two. Absolutely. Um, and so, uh, how would you guys, if you had to describe our system in one sentence, how would you describe how we're approaching this? Not to put you <laughs> on the spot, but I guess I am. Do uh, you want to take a stab? <laughs> I would say, um, kind of what, I, what, what I've been trying to highlight is the, um, really with the, customer owner at the center and, and really using our resources to best support them, um, but it, we do it in a very individualistic manner. It's, it really looks different 
um, for, for each customer owner. So I think our system does a great job at, at, at adapting and understanding and, mm -hmm. um, and supporting and, um, and offering a, no a variety of different types of uh, support. Okay, okay. So I'm going to try to, the, 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 the therapist to me can't help it. I'm going to try to reframe that. Um, so the um, <laughs> system that is, that is very customer owner focused and uses all of the tools at our disposal to provide care that meets that particular individual's needs. Mm -hmm. Okay. We see some other responses that we're <laughs> getting. Um, one uh, location has started medication assisted treatment in their fed federally qualified health center as part of an integrated primary care approach. Trying to fix what we broke years ago and not breaking things further. Sometimes you have to, yeah, you have to, you have to um, make sure that the, yeah, you're not making things worse while you're trying to make things better. Pain management review committee sounds not unlike some of what we do. Uh, who, ap who approve all chronic use recommendations, also providing medication-assisted treatment. Okay. Right. So it sounds like a lot of folks are really looking at, at providing medication-assisted treatment and really approaching it in terms of, of committee and inter interdisciplinary approaches, uh, not unlike what we do. Multidisciplinary group that meets to identify protocols that can support um, PRI care. I'm not sure what that means, PRI. Maybe somebody can, whoever shared that one, can, can share what that means. Uh, farm initiated Narcan dispensing and counseling. Hmm. Weaning prescribed narcotics through community individual education. Suboxone and Vivitrol program. Working on behavioral health integration. Narcan community distribution. Interesting. Um, I, lo I love that folks have mentioned the community aspect to this. I mean, oh today yeah. we're focusing on our care system and, and systematic or kind of individual changes that we've made within our care system. But I think it's really important to highlight um, that this is a, a community challenge, and it's right. great to see that folks are already mentioning those components that are really important. Right. Clinic committee focused on prescriptions, trying to utilize behaviorists for more comprehensive care. Um, and again, not only because I was I worked as a behavioral health consultant in our system for for many years, I think that that addressing the behavioral health component of addiction and dependence and substance use disorder in a primary care setting um, is an amazing uh, resource that um, can really help benefit not only your customer owners or patients or clients or, or whatever you call them, but your employees and your medical staff as well. And somebody said, learning from our past experiences, knowing that we could do much better given the resources we have. So yeah, sometimes it's a matter of reevaluating and saying, what can we use? How can we use what we already have in place to, to improve the care that we're delivering? So thank you all very much. Those are some great responses. Great. So, uh, so I'll now kind of uh, we'll transition into a little bit um, more of the specifics about how we do substance treatment here at South Central and and how we do medication assisted treatment. So, so this slide is really to introduce you or kind of frame the context in, in which it occurs uh, and the context in which we've tried to create a spectrum of services. Um, so in primary care, you've already been introduced to the integrated behavioral health components, the integrated pharmacists, the nurse case managers. Um, the, those are all the, the components that have been helpful to try to get MAT up and running in primary care. And um, on the other side, we also, we kind of merge that with the behavioral health resources that we have. So we have, um, we have a residential, we have an uh, intensive outpatient program, we have the hospital, which we've mentioned. Um, we also have a kind of more traditional behavioral health clinics um, uh, in a more behavioral health milieu, um, things like that. And, and really our goal was to, to bring these services together. To give you an idea of the lens that we started through, uh, we, we had basically a, a kind of a single prescriber standalone um, MAT clinic within the behavioral health division of sorts. Uh, which was our first, um, uh, I guess, dabbling kind of of sorts with MAT. And it was from there that we then tried to kind of generalize um, throughout the, our, our entire care system some capacity to do MAT and to, to include that into our integrated services. So that's kind of the, the lens or background where we started and um, kind of part of our story. 
So from that, our goal was to, again, create this spectrum of services with the idea being, can we meet uh, customer owners where they're at? Can we match their uh, intensity of need for treatment uh, with the clinical service that we would provide? Um, doing the best given the limitations in community resources and, and internal resources, the truth is, uh, you know, much like other communities, I think that we are resource poor. Um, certainly uh, the city on, you know, doesn't have the uh, capability to meet all the treatment need that exists, not in residential care, not in IOP level of care, not in partial hospitalization, or even um, even outpatient. So, so we do, um, you know, we have had to make do with the resources that we do that we do have, etc. So, so thinking about um, how it is that you get into our system, if you start with primary care. Uh, we have kind of that uh, spectrum of severity of, of substance use disorders, like we've mentioned. Um, you can see the primary care uh, provider, the customer owner, behavioral health uh, consultants. Th those are generally the first folks that you'll run into if you're coming into our primary care system with a substance use disorder. And, and once we started the MAT program, what we found was, again, you get, a, you get a full spectrum of intensity. So you have those that are IV users, that have been IV users for a long time, that are largely without psychosocial supports, no job, et cetera. Um, uh, and so those are kind of the most severe. Um, you know, one of the things we didn't really think about up front, but that we um, discovered fairly quickly, I think, is that we have a, a small number, but still a fair amount of folks who uh, started MAT out in the community. So they started their recovery and treatment out in the community resources, and then uh, decided to migrate into our system. So if, you, uh, so if you go back real quick and you look at one side of this being primary care on the right side, and then the left side, four directions is our intensive outpatient. So this is how we see our uh, intensity of, of, of care, if you will. That is um, the most intense being our residential or our IOP there. Um, then the idea would be that you would migrate to an integrated behavioral health, um, like an integrated psychiatrist and the BHC team. Um, in primary care, and then eventually, once you were really stable <clears throat> and, and further along in your recovery, uh, our goal is to get you back to the primary care provider who can then continue your MAT refill scripts, uh, leaving the rest of our system uh, open to take more severe cases, new cases, et cetera. So, so again, um, those severe folks would come into primary care. They might see the BHC who would refer them to that intensive outpatient or residential program or community resource, again, um, w whatever the, the person needed. Um, that, that would be the idea there. Uh, the community referrals that were coming into our system, those folks, uh, because they're already on their journey to recovery, um, certainly we'd assess them. But for instance, they might come to the integrated psychiatrist to make sure that we can assess them adequately to make sure that we do appreciate kind of what level of stability they've achieved in their life and in their recovery um, with the idea of, uh, you know, that they'd be less acute and easier to get to primary care eventually, so that's why they would start with the integrated um, behavioral health team of sorts in primary care. And then finally, you have kind of the mild uh, opioid use disorders or folks who maybe previously were severe, but again, they're a year, year and a half into recovery, something like that. They've reestablished relationships, resources, et cetera. And so those folks um, are, are game to consider going directly maybe to a primary care doc. Um, Melissa, I know you've had a couple of folks that you know, have fit somewhere on the spectrum, I think that you've had kind of long-standing relationships with. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about, you know, what it's like to, to have somebody that you uh, maybe have, you know, a good relationship with and how you can kind of either keep them in primary care or at least have some support to, you know, to refer them elsewhere if you need. Right, yeah, so I, I've had a couple cases in which I felt that the customer owner would really benefit from um, staying within primary care at least in the beginning of starting MAT and uh, and and so I've even done some inductions with our um, MAT nurse and pharmacist uh, in primary care uh, and then seen that customer owner for uh, their follow-up and in some cases they can stay with me indefinitely for continued MAT but uh, there's some cases where I do that short term with the idea that uh, eventually they'll be more formally admitted to the 
uh, more intensive program. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. That's a perfect example, too, where, you know, you have some pathways, but the, the truth is, in, in practical application, uh, you know, sometimes our primary care docs are brave enough to go ahead and bridge somebody while we're waiting to get them into our intensive outpatient, et cetera. We kind of, again, the, the real struggle is to meet customer owners where they're at. But, um, but I think the idea of having the system that, that you know is supportive or will be supportive shortly, hopefully, when space opens up, et cetera, um, you know, allows us to do some things we otherwise probably wouldn't be able to do. So to give you an idea, that's the lens through which uh, folks might come into our system. The pre-induction engagement, these are kind of some expectations we have of folks. Um, you know, they, they probably need to uh, attend an assessment with either a chemical dependency counselor um, or the BHC or both, actually. Um, completing an ASAM is, is part of our system. Uh, making sure that they establish a relationship with the primary care provider. So some folks are, um, have established relationships, but some folks have been without care for some time and are only hitting the emergency room or et cetera. So we, we do ask that they go um, start that relationship that we think is so fundamental to our care system here. And, and we do that by asking them to, to go meet their primary care provider. Um, it also gives our primary care provider a heads up that they have a, a customer owner that's entering our system and that with any luck, you know, a year, six months, a year down the road, something like that, that they may be coming back to primary care, hopefully uh, in recovery and, and kind of stabilized. Um, we obtain screening labs. Uh, we also have them uh, sign a controlled substance agreement. We're, we're going to dive a little bit into the details of the controlled substance agreement just because this is a really important piece and a, and a piece where that... Um, the culture of primary care and behavioral health are sometimes kind of at different extremes, and so this is some of the um, can sometimes be an area of um, questions for primary care uh, teams, or um, you know uh, they might run into um, substance folks can be really challenging in some ways um, with boundaries and and different things like that. So this is an area that uh, sometimes it's hard to know exactly what to do with some of these. Um, agreement pieces, but um, some, of the, some of the substance agreement include things like um, clearly defining upfront expectations about how the medication will be used, about what constitutes misuse, um, you know, introducing the, the role and idea of urine tox screens and pill counts, uh, how those occur, when they occur, the importance of them, um, the fact that they're required in many situations prior to medication fills or refills, etc. Abstinence from other substances, we highlight that because that, that can be a really challenging one to figure out, um, you know, uh, how best to navigate, I guess. Um, and so, you know, I won't go into great detail, but I'll just say we've had cases where someone's been stable for, say, um, a year or two. They've uh, really uh, entered full recovery. They've, again, not only been sober, but they have relationships, they have a job, they're living with their family again. Maybe they got kids back from OCS. I mean, all sorts of things. Um, and then all of a sudden they pop up um, positive for marijuana. Well, gosh, what do you, what do, you do with that? Um, how, do you, how do you investigate whether or not that, is, is it something that's really putting them at risk of relapse or is it something that, um, you know, as a provider you can accept and, and not worry about too much? And so that's where I think the consultation with BHCs or psychiatry or things like that can be really helpful um, in the context of a case like this in primary care to try to help provide some guidance of how to maneuver through kind of tricky situations like that. Um, alcohol and benzos are generally um, uh, safety concerns for us, and so, so we ask folks to um, not use those at all, you know, while they're on buprenorphine. Um, naltrexone, of course, is a little bit different. Um, uh, diversion is also another topic that we talk about up front and set expectations around. So then um, here's an idea of how we did the inductions in primary care. Uh, there's really not um, anything, you know, I, I guess I'll just back up and say when we first started this, none of us were experts uh, in buprenorphine or MAT in general, not primary care, not behavioral health. We didn't have any addiction specialists um, on staff. We do now, uh, I'm really excited to say, but, uh, but, but back then we kind of just um, decided that we would do this. And so anyways, so, so the induction process... Um, was, was pretty standard. We did do it in primary care. We used nursing, um, which were who, who was really important in this, um, pharmacy as well. Uh, we had a psychiatrist there. We did the, um, 
you know, four-ish milligrams. Well, we use, use the cows followed by, um, you know, two to four milligrams. Cows, two to four milligrams, kind of a standard induction approach. We had to come back the following day to check in, make sure things were going okay. Uh, we'd use up to an additional four that day if we felt like uh, somehow we'd missed the mark the first day. I think over time, we've gotten more comfortable with this, and um, we, we find it um, fairly rare to, to give folks additional doses on the second day. Um, uh, we did create an algorithm um, with pharmacy and nursing to go uh, to translate the cows into suggestions for dosing, for instance. Um, we had some primary care docs come shadow during this process, um, all sorts of things. So it was a, um, it was a good experience and, and went fairly well. Uh, Follow-up. So this is really, you do the induction and then what? Um, again, it depends a little bit in our system where you're talking. Are you in the um, intensive outpatient? That looks quite different than working with an integrated psychiatrist, which might work, um, might look different than working with a primary care doc. But, um, but those are the um, potential folks involved at each stage of care. A learning circle is something that we have that's a corporate-wide resource, um, which is kind of a culturally relevant <clears throat> Um, just that learning circle where folks can come together weekly uh, around a specific topic, uh, medication-assisted treatment, um, uh, you know, could be one of those, but, it, but they, they really, um, there's a whole array of options for learning circles from anxiety to wellness to just family get-togethers. Um, uh, yeah, and, and they're not all specific to behavioral health or substance use, but it's, it's, it's an important resource we have here uh, on, on the campus that folks use. So then um, kind of highlighting the stability period um, after you've started induction, you know, basically what we found, and this changes as we continue to make improvements and adjust our system, but I think we found that, um, you know, we expect folks to take about six months or so in something like an intensive outpatient program to stabilize to the point that we can think of them as transitioning maybe to either primary care or an integrated psychiatrist, depending on uh, behavioral health comorbidities. Um, where they are in their recovery, uh, how many of their resources they're able to, um, to use on campus versus out in the community. But um, as a general guideline, uh, folks are on basically monthly transitioning into every three-month visits of sorts when we're targeting primary care. Again, there's a lot of exceptions here and there depending on um, how long or what kind of relationship the customer owner might have with the primary care doc and what the exact situations are. But, um, but as a general guideline, you know, we think about um, when folks are six months or more in a treatment, they're having monthly or maybe Q3 month check-ins. That's kind of the primary care period. And I think that um, in, in some period or in, for some customer owners, as they become more stable, maybe a year or two into treatment, they're uh, transitioning into that six month check-in period, things like that. Coincidentally, I'll also say that, um, you know, it's not unusual around the two year mark that people start asking about coming off the medication. Um, and so while we don't have any predetermined ideas of whether people should come off or not, we kind of meet them where they are. I'll just say through experience that uh, that's not an unusual topic to come up um, that far in a treatment. Here's some quick numbers. Uh, the first one shows that, uh, you know, when we had that standalone clinic before we transitioned into a spectrum of services, we had less than 1% uh, of our primary care docs that were wavered. Um, about 1% of our psychiatrists were wavered. Um, that's transitioned to 72 and 94% respectively over the last couple of years since we've uh, worked on rolling out a lot of these pieces. Um, also, we had, you know, 10 or less customer owners actively managed on MAT in primary care uh, in the very beginning and now uh, have had uh, times when we've had as much as 150 active and we continue to, uh, gr to work on growing both our capacity in primary care and then also in our intensive outpatient, and intensive outpatient program and other aspects of our spectrum of services. So I'd like to ask you again another question. What challenges to providing MAT or medication assisted treatment are you experiencing currently or do you anticipate experiencing? Again, if you could go to menti.com and using that same code, 250632, and just let us know what challenges to providing MAT are you experiencing or do you anticipate? I'm really curious to see what people have to say here. Because yeah. we've definitely talked about some of the challenges we've had and some of the barriers, and, and some of that's probably the same across the board, but I would, I would anticipate that in different communities, different settings, there are different challenges. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I think uh, frequently in these conversations or conversations with, with other organizations, I think of uh, 
in some ways how lucky we were to be so far along the integration pathway already um, and and that we um, were able to overcome you know a fair amount of the challenges with regard to integration already and then you know this analogous kind of situation of thinking about substance use disorders um, I feel like we were pretty fortunate and uh, and well poised, but um, I can imagine starting with both might be a real challenge if you were going to mm -hmm. try to consider some version of doing both at the same time. Right. I think you bring up an interesting point because I, yeah, I think that because of the ways in which we already had kind of laid some of the foundation through the behavioral health integration mm -hmm. uh, approach that had kind of greased the wheels in some ways for people to be open to this kind of multidisciplinary yeah. kind of uh, cross-divisional approach to addressing this concern. Mm -hmm. um, so we're starting to get some answers here now to some of the challenges. Uh, one of the challenges is hiring enough Suboxone providers. I could certainly see that being a challenge. Uh, um, thinking about how that, you know, having people who have that waiver. Oh yeah, if I think if I think about our system, um, you know, I think that we had some efforts early on to try to encourage providers to get wavered. And it wasn't until we really had, I think, leadership buy-in, a good systemic approach. Um, we had our leadership on board with getting wavered. Um, that it that it really, we kind of finally got that momentum where um, once we got some folks wavered and some things active in primary care and other, other places in the system and other providers were able to see that, oh yeah, okay, that's that seems doable. And okay, yeah, I know so-and-so is doing this. And a repeated kind of, hey, this is a real need of our, of our customer owners. Um, I think we finally saw, uh, you know, providers' um, willingness to get wavered kind of take off on both sides, both behavioral and primary care. Right. One of the other responses up here, which I think is interesting, is capacity limited to physicians only. Mm. Our state does not allow NP or PA prescribers. Mm. And that was certainly, I know earlier on, that was a challenge that we faced. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised to hear that, uh, mostly because of the CARA legislation that was passed that went ahead and gave them the right. But... Um, I wasn't aware that, that there's some states that maybe have opted not to follow that federal guidance, but yeah, that's interesting. That could, that could be a really limiting, especially in systems where there might be at least uh, some, if not, if not um, many of your providers uh, being uh, nurse practitioners or physician assistants. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an interesting one. Buy-in from providers and leaders due to the suspicion it would lead to more work. Well, and I can speak to this. I think uh, myself, when, when this all uh, was on the horizon, um, this was my fear that it would, you know, as a provider who had been providing um, or treating chronic pain and dealing with uh, some of the issues that come up with that and um, dissatisfaction on both sides and using opioids and, and some of the chaos that can create. I feared that providing MAT would, would be along the same lines. Um, and I was very pleasantly surprised that in fact it w became one of the more rewarding aspects of my practice because uh, I could see the dramatic difference that it made in a person's life from going uh, from opioid addiction um, to being stabilized with MAT and being able to care for their families and be employed and contribute to our community. And um, so it created a, a, a lot of satisfaction, uh, mutual satisfaction, and, uh, and really not the work that I anticipated. And, and if I can just highlight, because again, this is, uh, speaks to that analogy with, I think, integration as well, because there are similar fears when you talk about integration usually. Like, oh my goodness, what if all the behavioral health people come? What if this creates more work for me as a primary care provider? I don't, you know, I don't really uh, want to be dealing or have time to be dealing with the behavioral health issues, et cetera. But, but I think both in that and substance use, it's almost the exact opposite. Actually, what you find is, is when you integrate behavioral health services or integrate MAT, um, it ha kind of has a stabilizing effect because those things are in your primary care system and they're presenting there no matter what. I mean, whether you go down this road or not, they're going to be there. And it's when all those psychosocial or addiction or behavioral health issues are not addressed that you get that chaos and that mm -hmm. kind of craziness that just, um, mm -hmm. you know, in a primary care Q15 minute system will just drive you nuts if you're not careful. So, um, so interesting, I think that's really great to hear because mm -hmm. I, I think that's absolutely true is it has almost the opposite effect that you'd expect. 
Some great uh, questions, some great answers to this question about some of the challenges. Integration of substance abuse therapy, that's certainly something that we've struggled with. I'll, again, albeit I'll made somewhat easier by the fact that we do have integrated behavioral health mm -hmm. pro, uh, consultants in primary care, so that helps speak, speak to that. Training for staff and leadership, absolutely. Clients switching to private physicians with looser rules who will prescribe concurrent benzos, higher doses, and not require routine counseling. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I, uh, I think we see that in our community as well, and folks who have the um, financial wherewithal to, to seek care outside of our system sometimes do indeed choose to do that. Yeah. Absolutely, we've had so, some struggles with community yeah. providers that we yeah. would say yeah. um, haven't had the safest or healthiest prescribing habits. Right, right. We did have a question that kind of uh, tags on to this, and these are, thank you again for your responses. I think these are great responses and really speak to some of the things that we've certainly experienced and, and continue to be challenges for us and, and some pretty uniform responses there. Um, we had a question from Aaron Schneider uh, regarding urine drug screens, and I think this was in response to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, when we check urine drug screens, do we screen for buprenorphine? We find buprenorphine in patients who are running out of opioid medication. Mm -hmm. Oh, so. absolutely. So, so yeah, I, mean, I, I think that's one of, one of the struggles of using buprenorphine is that it does have street value, um, and the street value or the, the value in buprenorphine comes from just that. Um, it, it basically helps people bridge those times when they're out of opiates or, mm -hmm. you know, they have them today, but they know they need to make it a week before they can get more, et cetera, those kind of things. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we definitely uh, find that people use it to bridge and that it shows up on urine tox screens. Or conversely, uh, doesn't show up on urine tox screens when it should be because they're in the MAT program. So it goes both yeah. ways. I try to look on the bright side, though. Um, I have had one or two of my Suboxone folks who um, initially had gotten it off the street just because they needed that bridge and then realized, wow, I don't crave anymore. I, f I, I feel like I can function normally. This mm -hmm. is kind of nice. Maybe I can, uh, <laughs> maybe, you know, it, it gives them hope that there is a chance for recovery. So Yeah, sure. yeah I, I would just highlight that's not unusual either. Um, prior to inductions, finding out that folks are using it off the street but wanting to get into a real treatment program. So, so uh, we'll finish up here. We're running short on time, so I think I'll just introduce some of these slides, um, kind of maybe uh, make high points here and there. So merging behavioral health and medical services, uh, we, we've already uh, kind of hit on this, but they're two very different cultures, so bringing them together in integration or MAT or substance treatment can be challenging. It really helps to have kind of uh, leaders on both sides who are really dedicated to the endeavor, and, um, and we could talk a lot more about that. In fact, we could give a whole presentation probably on just those merging of cultures mm -hmm. um, for sure. Um, teaching primary care docs how to use uh, behavioral health, that's kind of the initial stages of integration. Um, again, uh, just part of the process, I think. Um, promoting substance dependence as a chronic disease, you know, I'll, I'll put a quick plug here. Um, rather than seeing it as a mental weakness or moral, moral weakness, I do think that this is really important. Um, I'll give a couple of analogies. I think that you know some of the old school thinking folks were maybe quick to uh, remove something like buprenorphine from somebody if they were seen as relapsing or, um, or not f abiding um, the rules right away or, or, or things of that nature. And so, and th not that there aren't times, I think there are times when safety is at risk where you still have to consider that as a potential means, but really opening our understanding of addiction, I think is important in seeing it as a chronic disease. And I like to give a couple of analogies, um, one being that you know, if, if we really were able to seize a chronic disease, uh, if you think about diabetes, for instance, if someone who has diabetes goes out and eats donuts over the weekend, you don't see them on Monday and say, you know, scold them and, and tell them um, how they failed morally and then rip their insulin or metformin away from them, et cetera, which is something that um, some of the mindsets that folks used to have in, with regard to addiction that you'll sometimes still see um, if, if folks haven't transitioned all the way to that kind of chronic disease. Instead, what we do is we assess their need for the intensity of treatment. And if they need more insulin, we might give them more. If they need to increase or increase the dose of metformin, we'll do that. So we kind of do the same thing. Um, not, th not that that's a perfect analogy, but we kind of do the same thing here, which is, you know, if there's some sign that folks are failing, we try to ask ourselves, what can we do to better match their intensity of need with our intensity of treatment? And then um, the other thing I'll say is like with smoking, I think folks have done a pretty good job of coming to the point where they accept that, I don't know, it's an on average seven, I think, attempts, eight attempts for people that successfully quit. So 
Um, so I would just say, you know, relapse is not a failure. I mean, it, it might be a failure in that moment, but um, the point being that it's, it should almost kind of be a, expected in a chronic disease that you're going to have these ebbs and flows and, and periods of more or less success, et cetera. And so anyway, so I think um, helping with that um, perpetuate or, or educate folks around that model can be helpful. So here's some information on billing codes. I'll just say uh, January of 2017, some Medicare codes came out, G codes, three related to collaborative care, which is a specific model of integration um, out of the University of Washington. One of those codes, four codes, uh, supports more of the BHC model, which we implement here at South Central, but that was the first official codes for integration. Um, fairly qualified health clinic versions of those codes are coming out January 2018. Um, I'll probably uh, skip some of this. We've touched, we've touched on a lot of this, actually, um, though I will say that, for instance, uh, guidelines around buprenorphine um, post-surgery or during surgery or before surgery was an area that we had to tackle of sorts. Regulatory challenges, um, you can look at some of the regulatory challenges here. We've touched on 42 uh, CFR Part 2, but there's a lot of others. And then finally, I'll just say we, we have also rolled this out to rural areas. And so here are some of the um, high points or challenges that we'd, uh, we've had in, in trying to do that rurally and that we could answer questions about later maybe. All right. So I want to ask you one more time. We, you know, earlier we asked how prepared would you say your primary care system is to address the opioid epidemic? And we said we had about 59%, 60% of, of respondents said that they felt that their system was, was at least somewhat prepared to address this. I want to ask the same question after hearing everything that you've heard today. Um, does that answer say the same or does it change? Do you feel more or less prepared than maybe you did at the beginning of this uh, training to address the opioid epidemic in your community? And go to menti.com and using that same code 250632 if you could answer that question. I'm really curious to see if that changes substantially. It may not. It may stay the same. <laughs> Uh, but there may be some things that you've learned today that might lend, its, lend themselves to uh, tweaking this uh, or recognizing what you already have in place and thinking about different ways of utilizing those resources. So one person if, uh, still agrees that they're somewhat prepared. <laughs> so um, ahead of the curve, great. Where would you guys rate us, I mean, you, I think we've kind of talked about this before, yeah. somewhat prepared, very prepared, ahead of the curve. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, you know, as a system, I don't know, I feel like we're doing pretty well, um, again, on kind of all the different pieces that we've talked about. Uh, we have kind of an ingrained culture of um, plan, do, study, act, and rapid cycle improvement. So again, I feel like this has been kind of a multi-year journey, and I, I feel like we're in a pretty good, um, pretty good place, but certainly, uh, you know, what we um, there, there's always challenges, there's always work to be done, but I don't know, I mean, from a primary care doc perspective, you're probably um, the authority on kind of how the system feels with regard to, uh, from a treater's perspective. Um, I, I can say that I'm, I'm pretty sure that our customer owner satisfaction results have stayed uh, pretty much the same and are quite high in the 90-something percentile throughout the process, so I don't think we've impacted um, customer satisfaction, for instance, much, but I'm, you, know, you could probably speak to the provider perspective. Yeah, I think uh, as a system, I'd say we're we're ahead of the curve, and um, uh, I think there's always room for improvement, though. So I'd, I'm excited to to see more uh, rural outreach and mm -hmm. and MAT to our rural sites. Um, but you know, again, our system is ahead of the curve, but we're also a part of a larger community that I think is still struggling, um, and so um, so I know that there's 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 more work to do. Hmm. Yeah, I would, I, and I would echo that. I mean, I think there's a lot of community work to be done. This is, if you really look at true prevention and the, the root causes of, sure. of things like opioid use, and um, prescribing is one piece, but there's, you know, there's always the community effects and you know, challenges. Sure, sure. So very comparable numbers that we're seeing to this post-training uh, question ar around uh, how prepared a primary care system is to address the opioid epidemic, maybe swinging a little bit more to very prepared a little bit. Somebody, uh, I think, switched their answer to that, so that's that's encouraging to see. Um, I think that, the, you know, you both brought up something really interesting, which is, yeah, the context in which this work takes place. Um, we can have 
the best, most well-designed approach to addressing opioid dependence using medication-assisted treatment. Um, but if all of those other factors, the social factors, um, the uh, regulatory factors, the um, billing and this financial factors related to it mm -hmm. uh, aren't also addressed concurrently, um, it, it's, um, it's still not really addressing the root cause. And those are, those are larger challenges that we're not going to solve today in a webinar. Um, but it's certainly things that I think we all need to be mindful of and continue to uh, help address and, and, uh, and assist in, in addressing and to the degree that we're able within our systems, within our communities. So again, we thank you for your response to this question. So we've several times today we've we've shared with you opportunities and ways in which we can support you. We do so in a variety of ways, including consultation around a variety of issues, uh, including but not limited to uh, our approach to medication-assisted treatment in addressing the opioid epidemic. Uh, we've talked about trainings related to our integrated primary care teams, behavioral health integrations. We have our coaching model, which is an integral part of the way that we uh, support staff here at SCF. Uh, we also have um, classes specifically in motivational interviewing, which we mentioned uh, earlier, the way that we, we actually support. Uh, we use that in, as one of the tools to address um, uh, the opioid dependence issue. Um, if there's any of that that you're interested in or you're interested in finding out about any more of the ways in which we can support you around those issues, whether it's training or consultation, please reach out to us. You can reach us at scfnuca.com. Um, SCF events at scf.cc is our email address, or you can call 907-729-6852. One way that you can uh, learn more about the NUCA system of care is by attending our conference that's coming up this June, um, June 18th through the 22nd of uh, 2018. If you've never been to Alaska in the summertime, um, it's, I think, the best time to visit Alaska. I know usually folks outside of Alaska usually think of Alaska as snow and ice. Mm -hmm. uh, Come in June. It is beautiful and green and lovely. And this conference really helps you take a deeper dive into understanding the NUCA system of care and the ways in which some of the things we've touched on today uh, interplay with one another. So we, we invite you to join us for that. You can find out more about the NUCA system of care conference and all of our other trainings by visiting www.scfnuca.com. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at... SCF NUCA or email us at scfevents at scf.cc. On behalf of our presenters, on behalf of Dr. Shane and Dr. Coleman, myself and the rest of the Learning Institute and Development Center staff here at South Central Foundation, we thank you for joining us today. We hope that this has been beneficial. We hope that this you've learned something today. We thank you for your participation and your um, involvement in addressing this this major concern which we're all grappling with uh, across our nation and in all of our states. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you'll join us again for another webinar. Until then, take care.